good afternoon everyone uh, i welcome you all for for a, a new uh, session on uh, fair india covid academy we'll wait for some more time for all panelists to join and start the session soon uh by the time uh, mr posti joins i i'll request all the panelists to uh, to say do a mic test uh, you can unmute yourself and say hello uh, this is anjan can you hear me yes sir we can hear you thank you hello hi thank you ma'am yeah this is pun on this side so yeah thank you ma'am i'll i'll request the, the moderator for the session dr elia to please uh, check the mic sir am i audible yes elia you are thank you so uh, i'll i will start the session uh, uh very good uh, uh, good evening to everyone and thank you so much for joining us on time for our covid 19 academy panel discussion 
and uh, as you know uh, covid 19 academy is a joint capacity building initiative of the nidm unicef uh, who india hcl foundation and fair india for the volunteers and outreach workers across the country we have a very special panel discussion planned today uh, joint detailed needs assessment jdna a review of tools and processes 2020 this is the third session on our emergency needs assessment series we have a eminent panelist to share their expertise today uh, for some uh, urgent uh, uh, work uh, professor santosh from nidm couldn't uh, join us today so uh, we also have uh, uh, mr nm prasti who, who who will be joining shortly uh mr Pur, mr pushti has uh, over 35 years of experience in country as well as the uh, overseas uh, positions of importance in government non government social development disaster management and corporate organization his educational background is in engineering and uh, management and, and he has undertaken multi disciplinary training in india and abroad he, he was part of select global team of uh, eminent persons in the area of disaster management involved in the making of spare in uh, standard he is also founder chairperson of first of first fair india uh, thank you sir uh, hope uh, uh, you'll be uh, joining us soon uh, next we have uh, mr anjan bag from caritas uh, india uh, mr anjan is currently the manager technical for humanitarian response and disaster risk reduction for caritas india He has over 18 years of experience in disaster management, disaster risk reduction, and climate change adaptation. He has expertise in training needs assessment, implementation, and evaluation of programs. He also specializes in humanitarian actions in programming at national and provincial levels, strengthening emergency preparedness and response capacity for first-time responder agencies. Thank you, Mr. Anjan, for joining us today. Uh, next we have miss poonam mishra from uh, oxfam india uh, miss uh, poonam is uh, working as a program coordinator uh, disaster risk reduction in oxfam india she has more than 15 years of work experience in disaster management public health and wash sector previously she has worked for international committee of uh, red cross and red red crescent adra sphere and action aid and is currently serving at oxfam india thank you so much for being with us today uh, next we have uh, uh, mrs shaila thomas from kottayam social service society k triple s kerala mrs shaila has a vast experience in in disaster response and preparedness she has a masters degree in social work and uh, as a program officer she was part of k triple s kerala flood response in 2018 19 and 2020 uh, she is uh, she was or uh, uh, she is also part of uh, covid 19 response activities in kottayam alapura arnakulam and pathanam thitta district in collaboration with various agencies thank you so much for being being uh, with us uh, today ma'am uh, next we have uh, mr mandar ved from radar india mr ved has experience of over 20 years in humanitarian principles the response to disaster risk reduction and coordination he has worked with governments ngos un agencies and communities in six, six countries and over 20 states in india he has knowledge and skills of developing and facilitating capacity building training courses applying adult learning principles with creative training methods we welcome you sir uh, uh to moderate the today's session we have a uh, dr elia jaffa from uh, uh, spare india today uh, dr elia has more than 17 years of experience in humanitarian and development sector including many international missions she has authored several academic papers on on disaster management and gender and emergencies with a focus on women and children she has worked with care india international federation of uh, red cross and red crescent societies south asia and in india delegation and with undp she is currently also serving as chief of programs at save life foundation 
uh, i uh, welcome you ma'am uh, so uh, welcome everybody uh, all our all uh, all participants uh, we welcome you for this session now i would request uh, dr elia to start the session thank you thank you anil so uh, once again welcome all of you to this session which is the third session in the series being done on uh, emergency assessments uh, as anil also told you that uh, in this session we will be talking about joint disaster joint uh, detailed risk assessments so what has been done in the previous two sessions is that we deliberated on understanding how emergency assessments are being done by various actors uh, what are the areas where we could possibly improve uh, so that we have better effectiveness as well as efficiency of our assessments uh, so that's what the first session focused on and then we move to a session on joint rapid needs assessment which was the ne the next session uh, during that session also uh, all the panelists uh, talked about their experiences on various things like how can we have grnas in a timely manner within 48 hours how can we uh, have the tool in a way that uh, we avoid uh, organizational biases how do we ensure that uh, the qualitative analysis is also included and we are not dependent just on the quantitative aspects how do we make sure that it, the report is optimally utilized so things of that sort and we had really good recommendations um, which were around uh, for example use of technology so we had suggestions that we should be using mobile applications with where the data can be up, uh, entered in an offline offline mode also and once a person connects to internet then data can be uploaded on a server and therefore it can expedite uh, the report a uh, compilation of grna uh, similarly uh, it was shared that the drone technology can also be used and those are the uh, recommendations that we are also in incorporating within sphere's own learning and uh, going to have this revision and uh, include in the plan uh, similarly there were also recommendations on how to include or integrate the cross cutting issues how do we orient the team members around that um, there were also elements of advocacy to have more engagement of factors so with this we have a lot of uh, recommendations already for grna moving to the next stage what we do in assessments usually is joint detailed needs assessments now there are two types of uh, detailed needs assessments or we can say various types so one is where you have multi sector detailed needs assessment where uh, there is there is one questionnaire which is jointly being filled in depth analysis of all sectors or sometimes what we do is that based on grna and based on initial relief and understanding of the context when we find that there are certain sectors which are more impacted compared to others then for those particular sectors there is a detailed assessment done so we have experiences of both and on our panel we have uh, really experienced uh, experts actually and i'm really delighted to have uh, such a uh, rich eminent panel here who is ready to discuss uh, their experiences as well as come up with really practical recommendations on how we can improve the effectiveness and efficiency of jdna processes how we can improve the linkages with the other uh, assessments being done so on these aspects we are going to delve deeper to, during today's panel uh, discussion so to, to start the panel uh, i would just first like to check if mr prasti has joined or he has joined uh yes trustee has joined all right so uh, i would like to start the panel discussion actually with uh, mr prasti ji who has really decades of experience on disaster management all aspects of disaster management and he really has really valuable inputs on how we can improve assessments overall Uh, so we will be taking his inputs not just on JDNA but also across the assessment processes once we compile that. But for today's session, uh, Prestige, I would like to really uh, understand from you. I mean, you know that JDNA requires a lot of coordination with various actors, with different agencies who first come together for a, a for a sector uh, in depth analysis and then they separate. Uh, the other aspect is how we can make it. more accurate more uh, how we can do in depth analysis and for that in depth qualitative as well as quantitative analysis can we make use of technology you have a lot of experience on that and we would really like to 
hear from you based on your experiences. Uh, what would you like to recommend uh, in terms of the approach to JDNA, the tools we are using, the processes we are following? Uh, so, Prestige, over to you. Uh, thank you, Elia. Uh, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, the first point uh, I think uh, I've been asked to talk about uh, the coordination and the second is the use of uh, uh, technology or any other means to improve the uh, quality of assessment. So let me start with the, the piece on coordination. Uh, you know, this is, this is a subject still puzzling the humanitarian community, the, the stakeholders, be it government, be it the corporate, be it the civil society organization, there is a, a huge disconnect still. Uh, we, we began this process of uh, doing a, a, the best possible coordination some two decades ago, uh, but still then we are struggling to, to, to make it perfect or improve it uh, to, to the best of our satisfaction. The, the first uh, issue is that uh, the mutual trust uh, we all the organization, uh, the humanitarian organization should uh, build mutual trust and uh, uh, we should for a moment in a crisis time, we should forget that we are competitors. As an organization, we may be competitors, but, uh, but in the humanitarian crisis, we are complementary players. We are all together. So like, like we say that in a war time, uh, all political parties irrespective of their will, belief or agenda, they must come together and back the defense forces. Like this in crisis, uh, the, all the humanitarian organizations should come behind the agenda uh, that the, in a crisis, the affected community is our prime target and we should forget our, our, uh, uh, our, our USP and we should uh, in a uh, focused manner work for the affected community. Therefore, coordination is necessary. The second uh, uh, element is that uh, we should try as much as possible the, the, the empowerment and the, uh, the, the power of implementation, power of connecting with the community should be vested with the local institutions. And, and uh, we should really get out of our traditional style of functioning of uh, using our local organization as our contractors or our service providers or our implementing uh, specific task contractors. So that is the way we can really come together. And uh, the, the, the very concept of uh, URS, United Unified Response Strategy was conceived uh, several years ago, almost a decades ago, to bring the quality of interventions the, at the zero hour when the crisis starts at that point of time, or any institutional support, be it from the government or be it from the largest organizations, are yet to come. And that is the time if the, all the local organizations and backed by, backed by predetermined protocols. So there are certain things that is possible to immediately act on, and those things you begin to do, then that will build, help build mutual trust. And then that immediate response or the zero hour response will help us to go into a much better coordinated manner to the next phase, that emergency immediate response and all that. So zero hour response, that means that is more, more important. So my point will be that let us build a process by which we come together at the zero hour response, even if it is a small disaster, the local, how the local organization can come together and do with the support of some, some organization which having a resource. So these are the two main points that, and the third element in a improved coordination is that working with the largest humanitarian player. Who is the largest humanitarian player in India context? It is the government who is the largest humanitarian player. And, and so therefore complementing and working with the government is very important, but that does not mean that we become the uh, implementer of government initiatives. And if, if something is not happening properly and we, just because we are working with the government, we do the same way as government does, or government asks us to. That is not the, uh, the objective. Objective is that uh, we work with the government, we try to uh, uh, bring it to the knowledge of the government that what are the best way, what are the best practices, how the things are done, what are the ground realities, and what are those benefits of our, uh, through our local organizations and local uh, 
uh, humanitarian players, how the, the issues on the ground can be best reflected and all that. This is important. And most important while working with the government is the access to entitlements. In a disaster, government often comes with immediate entitlements. There are some standard entitlements as per the various schemes and as per the disaster management protocols and the relief code and all that. Those are there. But besides that, many times, in, in depending on the scale and intensity of the disaster, the, the government also comes with some immediate uh, entitlement. And how this entitlement will reach people, that's important. And my experience with the last several decades says that uh, the, the, they are all very well-meaning entitlements, but uh, it fails to reach people and then it becomes no entitlement. And in fact, I can only tell that my uh, decades of experience that the access to entitlement was best served post Gujarat earthquake. And after that, in many of the disasters, well, there, there are several observations that how we have not been able to make sure that access to entitlement has been at its best. Like we have failed to make it inclusive. We have failed to become uh, the concerns about the most marginalized and minority communities and uh, marginalized vulnerable communities and all that. We have not been able to address those issues, not able to address the issues with respect to uh, women, widow, disabled, all these things can have not happened. So that is, those are the areas where the humanitarian players can make a huge contribution to the to the states, to the to the to the, to the government. I think the government will go through a universal approach. They will, but the humanitarian organization will always go with a targeted approach. It is both are not contradicting, but both are. We have to see that how it can be complemented. That we go to the places where the more uh, affected communities and more needy communities and we target those areas and within those areas we, we target again the most needy communities in, within a geography but whereas the government goes to a particular place and they would like to declare a, a, a entitlement for everybody and sometimes it doesn't it, it often it happens that the most powerful people in the society are able to access whereas the less marginalized less vulnerable are able to access here comes the the role of the a humanitarian organization, they bring it to the knowledge that these are the people that do not have these, these uh, provisions or they do not have voice or they do not have the instruments, so, but they are needy. So how it can be worked out and all that. That is the kind of negotiations the humanitarian organization can do with the government and uh, make things work for the affected community. So these are some pieces of coordination work and uh, we have been uh, at the national level, we have sphere and uh, at the state level, we have got an interagency group. At the district level, we have got an interagency group. And we must work very sincerely towards making these, uh, the, these interagency setups or these uh, uh, collaborative efforts or coalition efforts as, as inclusive as possible. And we should forget that when we are a coalition, we are not organization A, organization B, or organization C. We are the coalition. We are the humanitarian community. So that moment, we have to forget we are a large organization. We have presence in all these places and all that that, that we should forget. And then when we go to uh, uh, ground uh, and we uh, have to begin to practice that the benefit of visibility also passed on to the local organizations. Many times I see the, the URS matrix. I see that large organizations are presence in large part of the country, but uh, in, in real sense, they are working with local organizations, but local organizations' visibility are not seen and not stated. So therefore, it, it, it is not a fair practice. So I'll say that that kind of uh, visibility must be ensured when we work with the local uh, organizations. And we must try to channelize as much resource as possible to the local institutions because they are the least cost institutions and they're closest to the community. So. There is no logic which can deny that effectiveness and efficiency comes by, by, by empowering and uh, putting resources in the hands of the local organization. That those are my pieces of suggestion for, with respect to coordination. Now, let me come to the how we can improve the uh, qualitative and quantitative uh, or the quality of uh, uh, assessments. Uh, so I'll now like to request Elia to put, I have given a 
a short uh, presentation if you can share it with everybody yes, sir can you see the screen now yeah so uh, uh, what i want to start this uh, 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 presentation with the the, uh, the statement that uh, the assessment has got three big objective one is that you can do some assessment before the disaster you can do some assessment during the disaster and you can do certain assessment after the disaster or activities and these activities are basically the, the predominantly uh, assessment or understanding and when we say that uh, pre disaster okay when earthquake uh, happens uh, you don't get warning so that uh, you lose that opportunity but but uh, disaster uh, earthquake preparedness is one of some of the pre disaster activities and like in flood you get a, a heads up time in cyclone you get a heads up time in fact in cyclone you get almost a four to five days kind of thing in a flood you get about three to four days kind of thing so you have got enough breathing time enough time to get really to conduct quick rapid pre disaster uh, activity pre disaster assessment like i'll give an example that all these things i am going to be telling you in the context of use of technology let me bring what i mean by technology the technology i am going to talk is the use of on man aerial vehicles those are commonly known as drones and use of artificial intelligence machine learning and uh, internet of things so how the, all these things can be brought together and you can give some real time and most accurate information like in pre disaster scenario if we fly a drone and we know that the flood is coming and the in flood uh, the it, it happens and it uh, starts getting into the mainland by breaching the embankment suppose through the uh, by using drone you are able to make a, a reconnaissance uh, assessment of the flood plain by looking at the condition of the embankment and you know that uh, embankment many places they breach in a natural course but most of the places they breach because of human action many times people break the embankments to get water inside the into their land and in the uh, so and then in the cyclone areas also where the, the mangroves are deliberately destroyed to get saline water to the uh, to their uh, land so that they can uh, do crop cultivation and all things like that so when you make this uh, rapid assessment by using this unmanned aerial vehicle you can know where are those weak areas where are those breach point potential breach point and immediately you can make prepared in terms of putting together men and material and machines and you can make community prepared and community alert that here is a weak area and you can you should be prepared and you can put resource also with the communities in advance and and help to mitigate the the, the potential danger and then you can also identify during this process where are the off lands where are those places where the people can take shelter uh, not that everywhere there were flood shelter or uh, cyclone shelter but there are off lands where they will be able to, so you can identify the potential areas for the the the, the relief camps and not only for uh, human being but also for animals where are you can do all these things you can do through the pre disaster assessment and during disaster that is when i am talking about during disaster that that cyclone is taking place obviously you cannot fly a drone but when the the flood is taking place you can definitely fly a drone and you can help the your uh, search and rescue teams your relief teams uh, and, and that where are the trapped communities and what are the kind of life saving support can be extended which is beyond the line of sight and kind of thing but that the, the drone application protocols are getting prepared and getting developed continuously by the government with the dgca and all that it's not at the final stage but these are certain things which are a lot of uh, innovations sort of uh, work is being done by many uh, technology startups and many human rights organizations and not only happening in india but all over the world it is happening so you can do this during disasters you can do this thing the post disaster this is most important thing that i want to highlight because Uh, i have been uh, we, we have been uh, pursuing this uh, the application of technology in a post disaster assessment stage and we did uh, uh, we conceptualized that uh, 
uh, by using a manned aerial vehicle and this uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence in IoT, then we can uh, not only quality qualitative but also quantitative assessment of the, the damage and losses. So we did try to do this proof of concept uh, post honey in a small area of coconut plantation in Brahmagiri Taluka of uh, Puri district, and uh, there we did it. And after that, uh, being encouraged by the result, we went to the post uh, flood Bihar and post flood Assam, cy post cyclone um, West Bengal twice, and the last was one uh, the post cyclone uh, Amphan in Sundarban. So I like to share some of the things that happened in the last. And the, currently, we are trying to really near perfect this module model of technology aided uh, loss and damage assessment by conducting it, the, the last trial in, in Jajpur plot area, which is undergoing right now. So I'll share with you some uh, findings of our uh, Sundarban work. Uh, we identified some 25 to 30 locations based on the discussion with the and Sundarban, you know, 24 program as Sundarban area was the one of the worst affected by the cyclone Ampan. And then there we identified 30, about 25, 30 locations. And uh, what are the things that you will be doing in assessment? So there are 15 that we call in, in drone, the people call it features, or you can call it elements, like uh, house is one feature. Uh, community infrastructure, community center is a uh, feature, uh, temple is a feature, your boats will be a feature, your agricultural land will be a feature, your uh, mobile tower will be a feature, your uh, embankment will be a feature, uh, your plantations will be a feature, your tree uh, cover will be a feature. There will be very large number of features. The features can always uh, contract and can uh, expand as you decide. So we identified about 15 to 19 features in our uh, pilot exercise in Sundarban. And we decided to deploy two teams of drones and, and a team of analytics. And we uh, did this operation uh, five days for mapping and another five to seven days for analytics. And we found that in these 20, 30 locations across 19 features, uh, and we estimated a loss of 68 crore. And how did you do this? I'll tell you in the subsequent slide that here is an example of the house damage. Even through this, uh, the, uh, the technology aided analysis assessment, you can identify each house. This is in the, the analysis, uh, quantitative, quantification of analysis, uh, quantitative analysis of damaged houses in, in Sagar Island, uh, where every house coordinates have been identified and the loss, uh, the damage in percentage and loss in rupees. And this, this, is, this was calculated. So like this, there all the features were uh, able to be identified and calculated and all that. I'll uh, go through a quick uh, video, which will help you uh, uh, understand the, how this process, uh, the, the entire presentation I don't love to share, but uh, during this seven minutes time, I think uh, I'm not taking that risk, but let me show you a, a quick short video. Uh, run the video. Double click, double click earlier. You can, you can see that uh, a drone is capable of capturing very high resolution map. And much on, on, unlike your satellite maps, this, this, and it is a very localized map. You can uh, zoom in and zoom out, uh, and you can uh, identify a particular area, and you can go into the any level of details of that particular feature and element. Here, this agriculture and the forest area is also covered that how it is uh, the, uh, the and you can also uh, look look at the the houses the damaged house even you can go individual house like in sagar island i showed you that an individual house could be done. look at these boats and these boats could be even we could count the boats how many boats were there and what was the boat uh, damage uh, like and all that and you calculated and we made an estimate of damage boards and we could calculate also the the damage fishing yards like fishing yards fishing dry fishing fish drying yards so also we could do that and i'm giving these are some of the examples tree you can even count the tree uh, where in a particular area where the suppose a orchard is destroyed or a plantation is destroyed you can count the number of trees destroyed and all that kind of thing 
damaged agricultural land how much area land area has been uh, there what is the crop loss that has taken place you can calculate the the acreage and you can look at the what kind of crop was there and you can uh, estimate the losses and all that all this the loss norm are we have taken it from the public domain like there are construction rates the pwd rates are there and all that we calculate we took those norms and we made a calculation as a result we could arrive at a conclusion that uh, the, the the loss in this 30 location in sundarban was ranging 68 crore and uh, the damage is in terms of percentage and loss is in rupees so this is what is possible by using drones so this is a short presentation and i like to uh, answer any questions related to this i would have loved to share the entire process uh, and i request that any time in future you have uh, time and opportunity i love to share the entire process and we can understand and this will happen how how it can happen how it can support like uh, uh, the ngos community are working and uh, we are doing this joint needs assessment so uh, if we can deploy drones and we can even identify pinpoint those potential high risk areas uh, of, of uh, the assessment uh, the the elements where we can make qualitative and quantitative estimates much more accurately unlike uh, today we are doing it through extrapolation mostly it is extra data are exp extrapolated and or it is drawn from the secondary sources as provided by the government and uh, like i have this uh, the other one exercise we have shared with the principal secretary disaster management west bengal government he has this, he has appreciated this and he is saying that thank you so can, much uh, mr yeah i'll close it i'll close it in a just half a minute so uh, so the, this can be done in a coordination coordinated manner we can work with uh, the ngo community we can work with the the government and it has to be taken to scale this is just a pilot of 30 locations and in jaspur also has the final trial taking place in 25 villages and we will come back to you with the much more details in course of time thank you thank you very much mr ji and uh, i'm sure all the participants who seen the video and also understood from you the application of technology in all the phases pre during and post disasters uh, more and more organizations would be willing to use it uh, based on your earlier discussions with us even in sphere india planet has been included so we'll be more in touch with you and for participants who are more interested to know about this you can e either write to us or prestige and i'm sure he'll be happy to explain further uh if there are brief questions we will be taking questions at the end of this uh, session also so please uh, you can raise hands or type your questions in the chat box and we'll be taking that uh so we we started the session with really uh, great understanding of how technology can make a difference we will now move to some on ground experience of uh, a team member who was a part of the jdn in kerala and from her we will try to understand what were the real uh actions what went well what uh, what was different or challenging and especially with her recent experiences in, during covid what has it been so i would request ms shaila uh, to uh, kindly share her experiences and what what went well what were the challenges what would you like to recommend both based on your experience of the kerala flood response and also in the recent covid situation what has been different um shaila over to you good evening everybody Uh, I'm Shaila Thomas from Cotton Social Service Society. Uh, our this organization is working in five districts of Kerala. Uh, that is the uh, Patan Dita, Ernakulam, Idiki, uh, then uh, Cotton, and Alapura. As you all know, that Kerala is uh, a state which is prone to lot of disasters. The highland areas experience landslides, or the lowland areas they always experience the seasonal floods are there every year. but the 2018 flood was the, the most uh, severely hit flood and uh, to build the community resilience uh, we all worked in collaboration with very various agencies uh, 2018 flood was like uh, it was it has caused a lot of human uh, human uh, destructions as well destructions to property so uh, we collaborated with many many agencies uh, i think they stepped down to uh, kerala to support us in their silent sort so uh, we have to, uh, with their hello yeah would you like to switch on hello? your video as well 
Okay. Hello. Is it audible or not? My my uh, sound is audible to you. Yes, sound is audible. Video is not visible yet. Uh, maybe it will take some time. It could be bandwidth issue. So you can continue. And, yeah. Okay. So we have collaborated with many agencies like Oxfam, CBM, Habitat, HA, and many more. So I I, I feel that the um, the GRP uh, that they had the assessment form GRNA form. that uh, the agencies had the uh, especially some of these agencies are uh, very ex have the expertise in disaster management i mean they work for disaster is a role so their expertise uh, assessment forms were given to us and this rapid assessment form the tool they were using that was i think a very uh, detailed one i mean all the areas and all the uh, this was uh, this were uh, they were uh, all were Uh, all the areas were covered in that so very detailed very technical professional tool they were using and the process uh, how they were uh, uh, selecting that that was also the work the response work they were doing that also underground response work was also very uh, i would like to appreciate them for the uh, that they have been now i would like to say that um, in fact that the, uh, all agencies have their own their own uh, tool they have their own uh, assessment tools but uh, for the for us the different agencies have their own areas of intervention so and they have their own tools so they have we go to the field with different tools of different agencies so we go to the same community with this tools so sometimes the families which we again the families are to be given this rapid assessment form so i think if there is a common tool say or a, a common uh, assessment uh, grna tool in there then it will be good because we can utilize it for uh, uh, common i one tool we can utilize for the community same community so we not need not to uh, go with the, in the same community with different tools so i think that will be a very good uh, this if we have we can we can develop a common tool in like that other thing i want to like every state the uh, assessment tool is will be different because the cultural uh, uh, aspect also is very much connected with them so whatever tool we are using bihar may not be applicable in kerala so that is another thing which we have to work out like that different agencies have um, as i told that in the in uh, for for example if i say in a flood everybody is generally affected the whole community is affected the whole community is a loser so what the one of the challenge what we feel like when we go for a assessment do we orient them we tell them that we are doing this assessment for what purpose but still they have a expectation of getting some support so generally the agencies also have their own limitations they have their fund limitations and all that so what happens uh, only the most Uh, if if you say the most significantly backward people will only be selected so again the community has some sort of um, that that i didn't get others got in that way so uh, th that is one of the challenge we as a ngo uh, generally face for that because due to the shortage of this uh, uh, shortage of this uh, uh, resources we have to limit it to some people whereas the whole community is affected and the whole community wants to get some sort of uh, for example if we say that covid 19 the uh, all the people are affected by this if a disaster occurs if a flood comes the all the communities entire community is affected of that so that is the uh, another challenge that we generally uh, as a ngo we face with that then this time the the last the 2018 2019 the rapid assessment what we did in 2018 and 19 it is was extremely different uh, what we have done in this 2020 because we all know uh, the disaster the 2018 and 19 the assessment forms that they were uh, they were focusing on the disaster only, disaster part only. while in 2020 it was not only the disaster disaster in the scenario of uh, covid 19 
so we had to change the rapid assessment team we have to add many questions that is also associated, that is associated with covid 19 also for example if i say uh, can we had the we had a we had a portion of the uh, assessment tool where we have to go to the cam and take the assessment tool. so uh, this time when we had to uh, go for the cam in the cam we have to see that where the uh, covid 19 protocols are also added in the questions or not for example we have to see that the they are given the uh, mask is given or not wash points are there or not the social distancing is maintained or there or not uh, such things we have to also assure in the camps so the assessments were very very different then another thing i would like to say that this time we have to face a lot of key uh, key challenges to go for go to the field for the rapid assessment as we all know the COVID, under the in this uh, covid scenario it was not possible to go to for the houses house house to house survey because we had lot of in kerala the uh, covid in the nineteen situation is there is a hike in the cases and we have lot of travel restrictions from one district to another district we will not be able to go then containment zones were declared so we will not be able to enter in the containment zones or the people from the houses are not permitted to go in the uh, go out in the, in the containment zones then there were strict declarations of the government which we had to adhere to then the vulnerable people like elderly different labor they we could we could not um, uh, go for them because they are the most vulnerable people so going to the field and as we used to do in the other in the other two disasters going to the field and getting direct the injuries of the beneficiaries was not possible this time so this time we have all shifted to the digital mode we have taken some key uh, data uh, providers like asha workers local administration members disaster management team same and then through them we have taken the scenario of the the disaster uh, losses and the, all the uh, details of the uh, people affected by the flood so i think that this is also another uh, challenge then i will also say that directly going to the when we uh, we will get a uh, right uh, senior ratio or she, or we can say that we will get a um, accuracy of the data then we will go to the community and we will be speak directly to the community people the community people are the uh, core people who can give the uh, accurate uh, situation of the community or the about the losses or the, uh, they can give the correct glance of the uh, this disaster while uh, when we collect data like indirectly or through some key sources so we have to again think whether the accuracy uh, of the we have to again think of the accuracy of the data so going directly was not possible so we were um, switching to this digital modes and through key uh, sources we have taken this uh, we have taken all this uh, data so another thing i would like to say that i think the uh, government uh, local self government they also have to take a, uh, i mean i mean they also have to take a initiative to gather this data assessments do this rapid need assessments so i think their active participation is also required for them uh, for for this rapid assessment assessment work some of the suggestions would i would like to put here is that one thing is that we all give our very importance in the rescue uh, rescue uh, period and the and the relief time we all are very active and like we do the pre assessment uh, rapid need assessment but what about the post rapid need assessment i think more of the post uh, rapid need assessment is also as important as the because the recovery part is a main part so now the people are the people who are suffering affected by the flood as well as uh, livelihoods and all other uh, areas which is affected with the flood and covid 19 they uh, that i think if we do the rapid need assessment of the post disaster then we can be able to uh, build the community in the better way and we will be able to help those people who are affected by the flood. so post uh rapid assessment uh, this is also very important and i think much more importance we have to give now uh, for the post 
in that the, the disaster preparedness also i think that because kerala is now now we all know that covid 19 situation is going to uh, extend because uh, no uh, say no vaccine is still available in the market so this situation is going to extend and the disaster is going to reoccur again and again so in that situation we have to uh, find out new um, new methods through which we can do the rapid uh, assessment accurately and i think for that we can uh, switch to uh, some apps like we have lot of digital apps technology we can use the technology and we have the latest technology through which we can surely get this uh, data so i would like to put some of my suggestions here is that the first thing is that rapid assessment tool and uh, de de developed hello hello yes hello you. we are able to listen you yeah yeah we are able to, okay. able to listen you okay so some of the suggestions i would like to do that we should as i said that we should have a common problem for all the agencies one thing is that second thing is the local self government has to also be actively involved in this a team should be made uh, so that the local with the local self government to for this rapid uh, assessment work and the government gaps has to be studied what are the government gaps i think that such question should also be added in the rapid assessment tool the another thing is that i would like to say that uh, this uh, developing an app that is, as i said that technology new technologies should be uh, should be uh, used and training should be given to the uh, field workers and the disaster committee members and the dpos and all that so that using this technology they can get, get us in this situation in this scenario of uh, covid 19 as well as in the scenario of uh, disaster Uh, in this situation, uh, more better accurate data we can uh, receive because, as I said, that in 2020 we were not able to go directly to the uh, directly to the field, but through key uh, key points only we could key persons also we could only we could uh, get the get the assessment assessment done. So that is the uh, another thing I would like to add to it. thank you shaila uh, is there any other point you want to make we have taken note of your recommendations and i think they are uh, really useful considering the complexity of covid and uh, with the current disaster situation and the challenges that you shared and also the recommendation that we have to focus more on the key informants at this time because because house to house or going to community might be a challenging situation um, uh, do you want to make any other point at this stage or we can come back to you during the question answers okay get on if that's all for my part all right thank you very much chela so uh, participants i'm i'm sure you you all would have uh, also uh, Uh, learned from the experiences that Shaila has shared, and some of you who've been involved in uh, flood response in other states also would have similar experiences. Uh, so it's it's definitely a different, unique situation, and we all have to modify how we approach assessments at this stage. Uh, now moving to another interesting area, which is about uh, how do we integrate and in mainstream prospecting issues, and especially the issue of protection. how do we ensure when we are going for detailed sector assessments protection is also mainstreamed in it and it's not seen as another sector which has to be only done through protection specialist how what can we do starting from uh, looking at the tools and also going to the processes overall uh, what would be the recommendations to mainstream protection in overall detailed needs assessment for this i would request uh, mr anjan to kindly share your uh, views and recommendations over to you anjan uh, thank you ilia thanks everyone uh, good afternoon and thanks uh, sphere for inviting me for this session uh, just i first would like to share something i, I, I know my uh, video will be blurred uh, because of uh, the light i think it is not have light I just wanted to share my experiences of the detailed needs assessment. I want to. Uh, I will be keeping it very short and um, uh, based on my experiences, uh, so not related. Anjan, to... can I disturb you? Uh, sure. Can you just put the curtain on your 
left hand side window. Okay. I can move my camera. Okay, fine. Is this okay now? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, so I'll be sharing my experiences from the detail needs assessment that I was involved and uh, practiced and also the present day, the way we are trying to focus the protection issues into the assessment and implementation of the program. So my experience says that the, the major issues uh, while uh, procuring or while talking on the protection is uh, is about a visible work versus non-visible. Most of the time, protection issues that we try to talk uh, is on the safety, dignity, access, and the rights. Uh, these are basically invisible issues. And we, we do not uh, see, we do not, uh, it is not a tangible results that an organization would like to get it. Or, uh, or any, any of the donor that uh, they uh, see it other than the reports uh, or, and the few case studies there. So during the assessment also what happens is that uh, we, we tend to give it more focuses on the other sectors like shelter, livelihood, food, nutrition, and other whether the, whether the tangible results uh, that any agency is going to get it. So uh, this always, this has been uh, kept aside, the protection issues. And I'll try to talk about a bit when I, I come to the recommendation, what we call it as a safety, dignity, access, and the uh, right. Second challenge is I, I see that uh, the efforts were there, but efforts were limited. I won't say that there have been no efforts at all because the organizations has been promoting it, trying to do a lot in the field, but it remained with the limited efforts with a uh, uh, few vulnerable groups. Uh, probably uh, I, uh, my experience, I see few vulnerable groups like women, uh, children, and PWDs, uh, but uh, as a whole protection was not considered during the assessment also. Now, still in our Indian humanitarian community, we I, I've been doing, I'm part of this humanitarian community last over 18 years plus, but I, I also uh, part of this process is still we feel good when we are able to do some of the as, um, relief. And this good, it comes, uh, comes out of our own way of doing it. It's the basically need-based or charity way of doing the uh, relief or the response or be it a recovery. You, you can really see it when you see the case studies being promoted, the way visibility is promoted, the way we talk to the people that these many numbers have been reached and also uh, also in assessment also we try to write, this many people have been covered uh, for, for the assessment. So still we, I, I feel we are uh, more towards the need-based or the charity-based uh, uh, responses or charity-based way of doing the uh, detailed needs assessment not the right, uh, because uh, ultimately the relief is the right. Uh, the, another challenge is that I find is the targeting, uh, where really would we target for the detailed needs assessment. So here I try to talk about uh, two things, that uh, the needs is always diversified, uh, diversity in terms of the groups also, and diversity in terms of the community also. So uh, what I would, uh, I would look at it is our target always been are troublesome in the detailed needs assessment because unless and until our targeting is uh, uh, really pinpoint, uh, the needs are going to come in different ways. So that's the, one of the challenges. And the, the, another challenges that I see based on my experience is the confidentiality of the data, confidentiality of the report, confidentiality, because we are trying to talk about the protections. Just giving my example of the challenges, uh, we, we we try to do an assessment in after Ampan. I'm just taking the recent one. I'll, I, I can give an all my exam experiences, what happened after Hila, what happened after uh, probably um, 2007 flood in Bihar and Uttarakhand, Kashmir and all. But there are a lot of ex examples of the, on the confidentiality of the data, especially in terms of the protection issue. Just giving an example. Uh, let's take an um, a woman who has uh, written back, uh, of course, uh, the example is that, that, that she was uh, trafficked and then came back to her house. And we, we, we as an organization, so we, we, when we go for that, we, we love to get that bites of that woman which we can quote it. So that, that's, uh, it becomes uh, uh, the USP of the assessments. Now, what is the confidentiality of that particular data and information she has shared? I know there are many organizations will be having a child protection policy or protection policies and the confidentiality policies, but um, 
at the local level, that contribution is there. So uh, I, I'll be elaborating it when I uh, come back with my recommendations uh, on the on this part on the confidence. So the four uh, five challenges that I talk about: the visible versus invisible, limited efforts, need versus rights, and targeting, and the confidence. Coming back to my uh, recommendations uh, that uh, I would always promote it because uh, there's a lot of efforts have been done to bring protections as in sector. Uh, as of, if you review all the detailed needs assessment has been done, uh, we try to keep us uh, protection as a sector because what happened is that earlier nobody used to think. So we had to uh, bring this one as a sector that at least people start thinking on that. Now if the time has come, I, I strongly pro propose that um, the protection should be mainstream and it has to be cross-cutting. Uh, because uh, in wash sector, it cannot be standalone without uh, protections. Uh, just giving an um, 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 example, uh, wash versus the multiple vulnerabilities. A uh, woman who is a Dalit, a uh, widow, and having a no land. Uh, no land. Uh, so she is already having a multiple vulnerability and uh, her water sectors is compromised or the uh, sanitation sector is compromised during disaster. So how do you look at it? Is only a woman? Or you look at it, a woman who is a widow who is a Dalit. So how do you differentiate? And also, she has got a protection issues with herself. So uh, that that's that's uh, what I, I always uh, strongly promote. That protection has to bring um, come as a strongly a cross cross-sectional and not as a separate sector. Of course, uh, we, we can have a, a dialogue on that because there are there are a mandate of our different agencies. Like uh, there's a child focus agencies are there. As a PWD focus agencies are there, but at the same time, they would be must be much more happy it becomes a cross sectoral or uh, the cross cutting issues into the detailed needs assessment. Secondly, uh, most of the time, what we are trying to look at it when we talk about the protections, we look at the vulnerability, a negative point of view. But there has been a community coping mechanism, there has been a strength within the community or within the individuals uh, whom we uh, try to uh, project as a vulnerability. So we, we need to move from the vulnerability to the capacity, capacity sites and try to also bring their capacities. Otherwise, what happens, our assessment becomes a one-sided assessment and is only based on the vulnerabilities. Next is uh, uh, when we are uh, trying to look at it, mostly what we are, when we are trying to look at the protection sector assessment, so we try to look at the safety, dignity, and access. And of course, we looked at the age, but uh, majorly uh, on the point of view of uh, communities. But what, what about the staff? What about the organization? What about the volunteers? What about their uh, protection? I have never seen on the, a report, at least uh, probably in my, it would be my ignorance, a report talking about the protection issues of staff, protection issues of volunteers and the organization in the assessment. So that, that's one of the things that, that I try, try to uh, look at it. Secondly, uh, I, I try to look at it on uh, assessment report, detailed assessment report, which talks about the accountabilities. I know the, our last uh, detailed assessment was done in um, Kerala. Uh, this is two, uh, 2020 and that was done in 2018. But accountability has to be made. Uh, uh, the rights will not come when you talk about the rights and the protections if, unless we fix the accountabilities. Accountability is in every sector. So if there is a no questions, the CHS is not been integrated in the questionnaire or the detailed needs assessment, the accountability is not going to uh, come in. The next recommendation I'll try to give that, um, uh, so protection is not uh, now, now is the mandate for a few organizations who is very, very sectoral specific, like those who work with the children, those who work with um, PWDs, those who work with the very vulnerable, specific vulnerable communities. Uh, like a um, uh, few organizations. No, it is not a business for them now. It's business for everyone uh, because uh, 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 when we want to work with the shelter, when we want to work with the livelihood, when we want to work with the, any other sectors, we need to have a protection principle in bed. Yes, everybody we talk about the person, uh, protection principles while uh, implementation, but it becomes a very sectoral response or sectoral, or sectoral reports, but the protections, uh, I, I'm not sure how much protection is built into the uh, response. Secondly, yeah, I'm very uh, fond of and a practitioner of uh, ICT, information communication technology, but I have got a bit reservations uh, 
using ICT information computing technology uh, while assessing or while talking about the protections is uh, one thing is because of the confidential one one side is the confidentiality second side is about the sensitivity the protection is all about the sen sensitivity and uh, that's uh, what i feel many people may not agree with me but, uh, but the protection is all about the sensitivity when you are dealing with the sensitivity uh, i i feel that technology sometimes um, uh, 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 are not uh, really helpful it's uh, for me i i say but I, I i can i can discuss further whenever there is a need on that and i i can be proven wrong also in future but i feel that technology sometimes misuses uh, the sensitivity part of it i have got a strong uh, evidences of that uh, that we sometimes uh, we go uh, we, with the mobile app or cobo collect or whatever the uh, app we use the collection of the data and we are mostly concentrate on the data collection part are not the human uh, we are collecting data from the human and we are talking to human not to the machine so of course there could be a problem of the training uh, training part and sensitive capacity building part but uh, this uh, needs to be uh, looked into so uh, before i end uh, about my uh, challenges and recommendations uh, i would uh, try to look at it in the three things summarize it is uh, when we work uh, in each sectors or uh, doing a retail needs assessment of course we are doing it maybe after three months or four months of the disasters uh, we need to really look into the safety part of the community and the staff dignity of the communities access and the age specific uh, agendas or age specific issues uh, i'll be happy to respond if there are any questions uh, thank you ilia Uh, thank you very much, Anjan, and you uh, really had some really strong recommendation. And hearing you as well as our earlier panelists, uh, it seems that we have to use a mix of both uh, technological solutions as well as human qualitative analysis, going beyond the uh, technology also to understand some of the really deep uh, sensitive issues. Uh, which uh, so I think a first round of using technology, understanding a broader picture, and then going deeper. Through a uh, one-to-one -one human conversation, perhaps is uh, what's required, and we can deliberate further on that. Uh, Anjan, if I could uh, request you just once, you you did mention that we should set accountability. We should go beyond mentioning or assessing whether the entitlements are provided or not, but and we should set accountability. So, just wanted to understand from you: Are you saying that uh, the JDNA report? should include a recommendation on who are the actors who should be responding to such situations or uh, addressing the issues or are you recommending a post jdna advocacy kind of intervention how do you see setting of accountabilities as a part of jdna yeah one thing i said is uh, the, this should come very strongly into the uh, recommendations uh, my first um, uh, point of view will be uh, when we recommendation, we tend to become very generic. Uh, and generic, we said that this many of um, the shelter has to be reconstructed and the construction, construction style has to be uh, there. But uh, is that because we have our own time when we do it really when the community uh, reconstruction phase is there or after two to three months of that, and we have a good time and analysis is done. So why don't we fix the accountability uh, who was responsible for that and who can fix these problems so the recurrent because uh, if you look at the recurrent floods happening in india in, in any of the states so right. that they are, hello yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, recurrent floods so do we not have a very um, accountable uh, assessment reports which we do not have to refer it back and the same recommendation do not come in after three years or four years because okay. if you look at it our recommendations are being repeated uh, years after years but um, how, how is the progress is happening? So it has to be accountability has to be ensured maybe after three years based on the reports. Sure, thank you. So we have to be more specific when recommendations are written rather than keeping it generic. We take that point. Uh, with this, we'll move to the next speaker and uh, be there with you. And Anjan, let's just be there because there are some questions and uh, towards the end of the session, we will be coming back to all of the panelists with the questions. 
so the next question would be more going from the cross-cutting issues to actually core sectors. Uh, the detailed assessment does try to go in depth in terms of the impact on specific sectors. Uh, we have Poonam from Oxfam and we'll try to understand from Poonam uh, that uh, Poonam, based on your experience, especially on WASH assessments and all, um, the, when, whenever we're going for sector assessments, we do need uh, some technical understanding also to understand sector issues. Uh, the way teams are constituted when, when uh, different agencies nominate their uh, team members to be a part of this assessment team, it's not necessary that you always get sector specialists. It's mostly a team of generalists. So based on your experience, how can we make best use of uh, the team, which also comprises of a lot of generalists? And uh, how can we make, uh, how can we get a really good quality assessment, which includes technical information as well? Uh, over to you, Poonam. Okay. Thank you so much, Eliam, for giving me this opportunity. So, yes, of course, you know, I mean, uh, I mean, first of all, definitely it's very much important, though I have listened both Anjan, Shaila, as well as Prestige, you know, and uh, definitely there are some very good recommendations has come. Would you like to switch on your video? I'm sorry, my internet is very bad. You know, if I put video, then we'll be yeah. lost. Yeah. So let's try it by this way. So, yes, I mean, uh, first of all, who is going to use the recommendation of this JDNA? Though Shala was talking about the rapid uh, need assessment, I'm not going to that one because uh, now we are talking about JDNA. So while doing the JDNA, we know, I mean, that we have spent at least some weeks in the field, you know, and uh, we are already established uh, with the life-saving activities in the field, you know. So first of all, what is the objective of this, this JDNA and who, who is going to use the recommendations and outcome of that JDNA should be the part of formulating this JDNA questions. So like what uh, Pustiji has already said in, in the previous session, that government is the key uh, player actually to like, you know, uh, to assist as well as to protect its community. So definitely like, you know, today, for example, if Santoshi has not come, someone else from government should have come here, you know, because if you are talking about participatory approach and cumulative approach, you know, then someone from the government should be here, you know, that also helped us to setting the accountability uh, in terms of who will do what kind of thing. Uh, second thing, while preparing, especially for the war sector, doesn't matter it's going to be a journalist team or is, uh, is going to be a specialist team, you know, first of all, the whole team uh, is needs to be oriented, especially about the objective and what exactly we want, like, you know, as an outcome from this JDNA should be oriented to the team. Second thing is that uh, we have been working in the sector of wash and disaster management for the years, you know, and whenever the sector expert is involved, you know, we do sector analysis, you know. So, for example, if we are like, you know, developing questions, you know, for this JDNA, uh, someone as a sector specialist should really orient the team about the general wash situation of that particular disaster affected area uh, to the like, you know, survey team, you know. For example, what is the general uh, water quality situation? What are the sources of water? that is being like you know used in that particular disaster affected areas you know what are the soil permeability limit you know kind of thing what kind of sanitation models are being utilized you know and also what are the general wash programs are being uh, running in that particular area and also it is also important that those people who are going to the field to assist the aftermath of disaster in terms of uh, need you know should also know where the government of India has signed what kind of disaster frameworks, you know, disaster risk reduction frameworks, you know, what are the DRR mainstreaming activities that each department needs to mainstream into their normal developmental programs. So if such kind of informations are already being oriented to the survey team, you know, they will be in a better position uh, to assess what exact information they need to take, uh, especially from the preventive aspect, then assistance aspect, where to cooperate and where to raise the issue of advocacy and governance, you know. Uh, the team should also understand understand the F diagram definitely because one of the objective of uh, wash programming is to like uh, prevent or re reduce the wash related diseases. So that kind of uh, diagram should also be understood to them and the barriers which are important to assess in the field, you know. Uh, so based on that, uh, what I will recommend is that if it is a detailed sector assessment uh, is required for in the JDNA, the key questions for the assessment needs to be developed by the technical as well as the program team. And accordingly, we can uh, have, uh, for example, we should not only have the people from the NGO or INGO sector in this uh, questionnaire development, we should also have people from the government side, because like you said, you know, this JDNA is also going to be linked with the PDNA from the government departments, you know. So if they are also going to use the outcome of this JDNA 
we should also involve people from the government side who can be the part of this questionnaire setting you know by that way we will able to make the assessment cumulative qualitative and it is going to uh, like address the needs of each and everybody including the ngo sector the local humanitarian leadership the community the panchayat as well as the government you know and also in in our situation when we go for a sector wash uh, assessment we try to take some like for example qualitative assessment tools also with us you know like for example uh, like you know water quality data field kits you know those kind of things we can also take with us you know and based on that you know uh, once the team is properly oriented especially on the aspect of hygiene promotion then water supply excreta management vector control solid waste management and wash in healthcare setting which is very much important especially in the context of covid you know we cannot only think about the community assessment you know we also have to go to the service providers you know and what is the situation of water and sanitation we also have to assess that kind of thing so based on all the information and proper training if the team goes to the field and assess the information especially on the was subject you know and take the information from the community from the panchayat from the government and other technical departments then we will be in a real situation that what is the ideal situation what needs to be planned and where these people are you know so those kind of data we can take out from them you know it is also important uh, to understand the upcoming coping and recovery plan Uh, from the community side as well as from panchayat and local government in terms of like you know in the coming months and years you know because for example uh, uh, there must be some coping plan they already have whether it's uh, for the water supply or for like you know sanitation or for like you know uh, like you know uh, this vector control and uh, healthcare wash in healthcare settings you know so we also need to understand because now as per the revised government plan you know each department should have their like you know emergency preparedness plan uh, for disaster whether it is there is a pandemic or flood or whatever kind of thing so what are the plans that government has what are the uh, we are talking about bd is village disaster management plans you know and we talk every year like you know panchayat should have the uh, dri integration into wash integration for emergency response into their plans so what are those plans you know that they have developed for the coming year uh, i mean is something there or not there because this will help us to plan our assistance to the field you know and this will also help us to set the accountability and also if nothing is there this also raises the issue of advocacy that this has been planned you know this has been agreed you know why it's not the uh, part of the planning you know so this data also needs to come from the field when it comes to water quality definitely i mean we also need to understand that now we are talking about uh, uh, integrated water resource management you know so if the team goes to the field you know definitely they need to tell us the current situation of uh, water sources what was before what was now actually so in that situation we will understand and that okay yes of course before the disaster it was only the for example the uh, the ground water so source was there but now it's flood okay let's use a use of surface water so those kind of information the field team can give to us you know based on that we can plan the recovery operations you know depending upon the source availability of water secondly if they can able to test the water quality parameters if not they can they can go to the uh, local government phd department and they can tell us the water quality data plus also the orientation that we have given to them will also give the data especially on the bacteriological physical as well as the chemical aspect of the water this will help us to uh, plan the intervention also we also need to understand that if there is a camp setting available in the field because in some situation it might happen that it will go for months you know so what are the camp requirements are there you know in terms of wash that also needs to be assessed by the team and one more thing when it comes to sanitation there are several models available in the field you know so but again i will be conservative in terms of different technologies uh, like you know use in the field because in india i have seen that many people use so much uh, so many technologies which are not accredited internationally actually so whenever you apply any water purification technology or specification whatever you use you know please make sure that those technologies are accredited by the certified labs of india and who also that we promote very much you know because i have seen so many like examples in the field you know that people promote so many technologies you know like you know local technologies but they are not like you know certified technologies so there are so many innovations available but please go to the websites of like like you know niri as well as ministry of uh, like you know drinking water and please see whether the technology that you are using is really accredited or not uh, which is really important to know also we also need to understand 
uh, the power avail availability in the field because now uh, government of india would like to go for the pipe water supply system somewhere we have like you know uh, dug wells somewhere we have hand pumps you know and we also need to understand that we are also, also talking about build back better you know so while we are doing the recovery and rehabilitation operations we also need to understand what are the sustainable measures that we can promote under our recovery and early recovery programs you know so for example if you can see that in the project area okay fine power is there or if power is not there but there is a proper like you know solar light available so can we also promote the renewable use of uh, like you know energy or not you know so by that we all Similarly, for example, uh, in Chhattisgarh and in uh, area we have seen, for example, so many installation of solar powered water pumping system. Because not in every way are you will able to uh, set the power uh, like you know pipe water supply. So what are the alternate system that we can promote instead of so many like you know boring you know uh, like an installation in the field? Because in some times like you now what uh, we also need to understand what is the government plan for a longer term. So if you see the Ministry of Jal Shakti, they are promoting more towards pipe water supply. So in the coming years we would like to go. towards that direction so, so when if i if i may uh, interrupt just yeah. trying to understand the recommendation that you are making right now are you yes. saying when when we need to understand further in terms of government schemes and what works in what region uh, are you suggesting this as a part of the jdna or are you suggesting also a secondary data analysis to because uh, if you go for the jd uh, this uh, detailed uh, need assessment you are not going to do only assessment at community level the stakeholder analysis is very much important when it comes to wash you know so one is the community second we have to think about the panchayat planning what the panchayat has uh, thought about you know what is their emergency plan what is their developmental plan similarly what has been planned as a as a emergency preparedness plan for wash public health department you know what is the longer term plan so we have to think all the aspects you know and in that way we plan because what is our alternate uh, uh, um, uh, um, um, absolute objective is to assess the government because there is a humanitarian situation now but in us in us time gradual time we have to link this relief rehabilitation to the development so while planning think in between the lines you know because we are assisting uh, the uh, because it's a humanitarian situation that's why there is an additional support is required from our side but it will go Towards the normal situation in a gradual manner. So in yeah. that way, we have to think about all these aspects. Yeah? yeah. Thank you so much. I think that's a very important point that uh, we are, we have to think beyond the early yes. recovery and yes. recovery yes. Yes. Yeah. how we can and develop the development. May I go ahead? Yes. Okay. Shall I move earlier? Yes. Yes. Please. Yes. after that for example if you go to odisha side you know if you see that there is a heavy like you know especially for the ganjam and other uh, districts you know uh, there is a heavy like you know kind of open defecation which has really concentrated the nitrite and nitrate concentration into soil you know that we also need to understand for that that's why when it comes to depth wash assessment please also talk about the regional water resource department for example uh, there is already in bhubaneswar available you know so now because ministry has already combined both the water resources as well as the ministry of drinking water and sanitation all together so this is also going to give a proper information to us especially about the hydrology data as well as the morphology data you know so that information is also important when it comes to ict use you know uh, in wash you know there are so many options available but again i will be very much conservative uh, and it should be based on the need hai na so not only we should only bombard the like you know technology into the field but we also need to understand the local uh, capacities available local adaptation practices available and and just take a, like you know uh, rational decision where to use technology where not to use technologies because we also have to think about the social and behavior ch change communication aspect of the community also what they like what they not like especially in terms of hygiene promotion also so first of all okay knowing uh, the the context as well as the problem uh, definitely we need to understand the community perception is es uh, especially for the risk you know and then accordingly design especially our soft component activities as well as the hard component activities also uh, one of the problem that we face is that uh, when we get the data we don't get proper population data especially uh, the population that we talk about you know right up in next one minute we have one more speaker and then question answer okay. just okay so i mean yeah i think so i'm just jumping you know now so think in that way plus also think about the need of uh, this uh, vulnerable population especially the pwds as well as the oldest people because wash is not only limited to uh, normal people we also need to think about the assistive uh, requirements of uh, structure uh, for the protection for the people with disability as well as old age 
and uh, plot and say programming needs to be addressed. For example, if the sanitation, definitely you need to think about the light in the uh, sanitation and also the, uh, the positioning of your toilet system, you know, that is also important. And also, for example, uh, based on the ideal situation, uh, what the government has agreed, you know, in terms of uh, providing the entitlement as well as the support of the people, where exactly they are in the field, you know, and what are the like, you know, influencing as well as the governance, the uh, uh, advocacy needs are there that also need to become from the your assessment, you know, and uh, more importantly, please collect important phone numbers, you know, starting from the community to the department so that your technical person in terms of requirement can also ask questions if you're not able to do that one. And uh, also, if possible, collect costing and specification of some locally available positive coping and adaptation practices for WASH, including ecosystem cleaning. So this is important. And for that, you need to invest time as well as put proper budgeting, especially for the detailed need assessment. So thank you so much with this one, Ilya. So this is only I can do in seven minutes. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Poonam. And I think within this short time, you were able to cover a lot of aspects and many areas where we could really improve some practical recommendations. I think you had a longer list, so we would like to connect with you again later, maybe post-session to understand what else can be done so that we don't miss anything in our reports. Thank you so much for that. Okay. Uh, we'd like, we would now move to our next speaker, who's the last speaker and post that we will be opening for question and answers. Um, so the next question also is very interesting and also a concern which has been there for a long time, especially when it comes to JDNA, because this process, the detailed assessment is done to inform the early recovery, recovery and rehabilitation interventions. But the, the challenge or if the most unfortunate thing is that by the time the detailed assessment is done, media coverage goes almost, uh, reduces to almost zero and then uh, the number of donors reduces, the number of organizations working in field reduces significantly. And therefore, there are not many uh, takers or users of this information. So uh, it will be really important to understand how we can engage or involve more and more actors uh, in the process as well as in utilizing the JDNA findings so that uh, even in terms of the early recovery and recovery activities, there is there are a lot of factors and, and communities are able to uh, come out from the impact of disaster and uh, move towards the path of development. So I would request Mr. Mandar uh, to kindly share his views on this. Uh, good evening, everyone. Hello, am I audible? Yes, Mandar, you're audible and you, we can see you. Thanks. Okay, great. So I have kept my stopwatch on and I will try to finish my thing in five minutes so that all of us will also be able to uh, interact and ask questions. Um, I have been reflecting on this uh, topic which has been given to me since morning and I have written my presentation as needs there. One report in our hand, need is there. Now, how do we get demand? So demand question, is the critical challenge you now once we have a report in, in our hand. So one critical thought which came to my mind is that most of us are waiting for the report because we want to develop our own project. But very few people in our coordination are concerned about taking these findings beyond our agency to various stakeholders. Now, that is where I think uh, once the JNA report in our hand, the role of coalition and role leadership of coalition starts. And how do we really communicate needs with state government? Because I mean, from my experiences, recent experience from Kerala to Maharashtra and Kataka floods last year. So how do we really communicate the needs came out from JDNA with state government so that state government also to submit its uh, policy which is favorable, which is fostering the recovery process. Second is that many of us are at the district level, but we're communicating district administration. Uh, now it is time to communicate with district administration and mobilize district administration resources towards early recovery and long-term rehabilitation reconstruction process. So uh, we have a sort of reads assessment report in our hand. We should be able to make good presentation to district administration so that district machinery is also geared 
towards uh, the uh, uh, the recovery process. Many times at government level, it is that response happened, now concession will come, now the process of rehabilitation will start, everything is then, um, then becomes slow. But we as civil society organizations or as coordination, I'll have responsibility to keep mobilizing all the machineries at government level. Now the third change for all of us comes in when we have to have to donor. Now many of us in Kolapur, Sangli, especially in Maharashtra and in Kataka, we found that many of the corporate social foundations were interested to support long-term recovery and rehabilitation, but there were very few agencies which were able to reach out to those corporate resources and mobilize them and convert it into recovery rehabilitation. So what corporate patients did, they started doing independent projects, which are actually not part of our organization. So we also should be very, uh, very, um, I will say vibrant in reach out to many of the actors who really want to come and join the recovery process. Uh, last point in this uh, is that uh, how do we really convert community voices in our uh, needs assessment report? More we can community voice towards the and rehabilitation process, we will be able to mobilize more resources, more actors in the recovery process. Um, last point in this first category is that many times uh, it happens that we are concerned about our own minds. But when corporate tax are coming in, or governments are coming in, coming in with their own mandate. So we we'll, should be able to look at the mandates and, and, and articulate needs according so that they also become part of the recovery process. And we are able to mobilize the resources in the proper kind of recovery and rehabilitation process. Now the second category of, uh, uh, of thoughts which came to my mind is that how do we really express the needs which has been stated in the report. Now, many times our reports are more technical and government stakeholders or uh, corporate, corporate donors or committees have their language to understand these needs. So the point is how do we really express them when making their case? A uh, few examples, like for example, uh, many people in this uh, outside world look at recovery as outcome, but for us it is a process whereby we are able to empower communities, whereby we are able to take communities towards just a risk reduction. So it's a process. So many times stakeholders, especially government and the corporate actors or few uh, donors look at it as outcome. So when they express needs, we we should be able to uh, present, I don't know how uh, to adequate this language, but how are we how are we caging in these needs so that people are able to understand the terminology of recovery in their own, uh, own um, language. So that is one. Second point in this category is that how we really access needs of more vulnerable. And I, I was listening to earlier presentations as well, and there were a few things things we discussed. Like for example, uh, protection can was also. Now, uh, we have found that many of the protection or air traffic cases happen uh, not immediately after disaster, but after the relief or response is over. And um, especially in, I found that the actual tracking started after three four months. So uh, we should be able to express this protection need in a way so that people, communities, stakeholders at the community level, stakeholders at district level and stakeholders at that level are aware about what the threats are emerging the most vulnerable people. And is, uh, in recent experience, psychosocial care, protection, education, livelihood are key concerns and we should be able to articulate them, express them in such a way that they are being understood by the other stakeholders as well. Uh, similarly about water sanitation and uh, shelters as well. How do we really explain the need of resilient shelters, resilient water structures, and uh, mobilized community, mobilized stakeholders around it is a big 
uh, concern after we come to our disaster assessment. Last, last point is out. It is not matter of a project of recovery, restructuring, rehabilitation. It is about an opportunity to build back better. So the how we are able to mobilize all the stakeholders around the theme of back better will help us mobilize more number of stakeholders. And it is not only matter of only mobilizing donors, it is also a matter of mobilizing local self governments. It is also mobilizing district administration about government uses at state level and communities. So that's all short I have come. Completed. Sorry, I took three more minutes. No, no, thank you very much. It was very brief and precise. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure we all benefited. Uh, I'm conscious we've already reached the time for end of the session. However, we have really interesting questions in our chat box, uh, around six questions that have already noted. Uh, so I would request the panelists to speakers to be as brief as possible in responding. Uh, the first three questions are around drones. So if I could request uh, Prestige to kindly respond. Uh, the questions are uh, from Mr. Sanjeev Behera. It is, what is the cost involved in drone technology, uh, both uh, Apex and Capex? Uh, the other question from Mr. Rajkumar Datta is that, is it permissible to use drone in Sundarban Delta area? And the third question is, uh, is, is there a legal procedure for NGOs to own drone? That is by uh, Mr. Vibhas Chatterjee. So, Ms. Uh, Prestige, if you could take uh, these three questions in as brief as possible, please. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, 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 The Regarding the cost, uh, you know, the technology may, is gradually making things cheaper and cheaper. All... Um, uh, the, the, over the last three years, we have been working on this uh, drone application. We have seen the cost dropping significantly from year to year. And uh, so today, I can tell uh, is that a drone costs around about uh, ranging from two to seven lakhs uh, a, a drone. Uh, but the two lakh drone obviously will not be capable of doing the mapping, the kind of mapping that we desire. Uh, in our assessment work. So uh, average cost about five to seven lakhs probably will be a good capex for a drone. Uh, and then, uh, uh, but mind it, drone is not a machine which does everything automatically. Drone has to be managed. So there is something called drone pilot. And then there is something called drone image processing skill. That uh, what the image, there are softwares, there are hardwares, there are uh, skills, the skill set. So image processing skill set. Then there is analytics. That how you convert the image to information and data. Uh, information. When I say information, it's a qualitative information. When I say data, it is quantitative information. And uh, the average cost of a drone. The question, if I can try, uh, that. Um, Probably uh, the cost today is about um, eight to ten thousand uh, a day, or even uh, it can go as low as five to seven thousand a day uh, for a drone. Uh, and a typical drone can cover about to eight to ten square kilometer area in a in a day, six hour flying. Uh, but remember that every drone has to uh, go because the battery life is limited. So it has to go and come back and then again, another battery has to fit it and it should go. But it usually, usually uh, there will be more than one drone to be used to get uh, optimized, uh, uh, optimized uh, result. And we have always used to uh, pair drones, two drones at a time to, to, to get the details. And uh, uh, in terms of permission, uh, today, the, the, you know, the, the regulations are still in the making. Uh, government, in principle, uh, encourages the use of drone. If you have known by now, the Prime Minister has gone on record saying that all 650,000 villages in the country will be mapped by using drones. So there is a program and then the pilot scale. The Survey of India has started uh, in six states and uh, the first 100,000 villages will be completed in a year's time, and this will be scaled up. Uh, so gradually, this ecosystem is getting ready. Uh, today, there are not num the, there are a large number of drones, but not enough drones to be useful for this purpose. 
so this is what the the whole technology is uh, working the startups are working towards making the drones appropriate for this exercise and uh, the 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 skill set is also emerging there are a lot of training programs going on and all that and uh, we we are also conducting training programs and we are uh, in fact the first women drone pilots we trained in odisha uh, and then the 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 government permission uh, whether a drone can be flown uh, one can fly drones in sundarban yes we used it twice and uh, today permission is necessary for the local administration and uh, the government is very supportive of this uh, but the drone has to be compliant and every drone that you fly has to be registered and uh, the the drone pilot has to be also recognized registered pilots and uh, the drone has to have compliant norms and these norms are getting developed so nothing is perfect right now but in the ecosystem is developing and we should all support the evolution of the ecosystem in the best possible way and we always say that the the data security is important the uh, the, the uh, all drones should be uh, indian drones uh, you know that most of the drones today in the country are chinese drones uh, probably there will be time when the indian drones will fly everywhere and the because it's not a very high tech uh, instrument uh, so it, it can be locally produced and all that and our and the uh, uh, scientist engineers are capable of developing and all that uh, so that's why that ecosystem is developing i uh, think i i answered all the questions yeah yeah you have uh, so i'll move to the next question from uh, rama rao who is again touched on a very important point he's saying that uh, agencies like csos and along with sphere we are doing joint detailed needs assessment while government usually does the pdna so how can we bring synergies between these two processes and uh, ensure coordination of efforts uh, we were expecting uh, professor santosh to take this question actually but uh, if any of the panelists would like to briefly share your reflection on this uh, any of the panelists please can i say something on this sure mr ji uh, uh, yeah that is important uh, the uh, the what government does and what the civil society does human rights organization does there has to be synergy and in fact when we are advocating about use of technology we we tell that this is the way the the synergy can be established between the humanitarian action and the the state action uh, so we should we should there is no question about it that uh, it should or it should not it always should be together but only thing is that how we establish trust with the government and how government builds trust on us and all that so that is important sure um so there are a couple of questions from uh, afta uh, the first is about uh, whether market assessment and feasibility study can be included can be made a part of detailed need assessment um, i think since we already have experiences of mr tool being in, incorporated in some of the responses uh, assessments i think in post uttarakhand response as well as pilot this was used um so if the answer is yes but perhaps if if we have to uh, modify the tools further to look at feasibility study uh, include more questions around it that's doable so i'm not posing this question to panelists but the next two questions are more about gender sensitive need assessment especially in the context of covid uh, one is because of restricted conditions there you can't really reach out and sit and do a detailed discussion with people and also sometimes there are uh, remote when you do assessments remotely there are sensitivities in work so what if any of the panelists has an experience on what can be done in this context what tools can be used to ensure the sensitivity also and get a quality assessment for uh, uh, a gender sensitive needs assessment so, uh, any reflections from any of the speakers Can I come in, Elia? Uh, uh, please go ahead. Uh, Anjan, you want to answer? No, please go ahead and then I'll add. Okay. Shall I, Elia? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Yes, of course. You know, I mean, COVID made the life more uh, difficult when it comes to accessibility. But we tried some ways. You know, 
uh, first of all you know like you know uh, we've uh, made because we work uh, through local partners where like you know we're promoting the local humanitarian leadership you know so we made sure that all our partners have uh, women representation in in the team as well as in our uh, task force teams in the field you know a uh, second thing we also like you know mapped the uh, women headed like you know ngos you know and uh, the volunteers uh, we did like you know e like you know webinar with them you know and try to understand the context of uh, and the sensitivity of women and in terms of uh, the the impact of covid on to them uh, starting from the frontliners to the community and when we did our uh, programming we considered all those aspects also plus also when it comes to digital like you no know, way of working you know uh, because we use so much whatsapp as well as the uh, digital way of working you know we also ensured one policy uh, which is a digital uh, policy that we made sure that our partners they signed you know we also oriented all the staff as well as the committee mobilizers working in the field to ensure that that gender sensitivity is also maintained also as a part of our overall response we ensured that the basic like you know the fundamental rights that women have you know Uh, through our gender justice team you know we oriented all the partners as well as the mobilizers that what are the parameters and what are the basic like you know uh, social uh, protection schemes that women have you know in term from the government of india that should be respected as uh, as a part of our overall program and where uh, it is a embedded uh, issue yes of course we are going to uh, uh, safeguard it uh, uh, from us as well as as a part of safe programming and safeguarding and also when it comes to case management we also try to link with other like you know export agencies on women issues yeah thank you uh, anjit do you want to add anything to it just very brief if possible we have one more question to take yeah i think the question uh, talks about uh, much more how we like to consider the gender sensitivity to you know, sensitivity in the aid assessment as of now i i think india the our question here for the detailed aid assessment even the jrna do not consider much on the covid Uh, specifications on covid related issues because we have never faced uh, such a situation so uh, what i would suggest is that we need to uh, really review our uh, questionnaires uh, for the assessments be it the jrna or the detailed aid assessment in the perspective, uh, perspective of unforeseen disasters uh, because our our uh, questionnaires never seen that one so what we did it is that in each organization have adapted based on the situations so probably we can get all the organization together and how the adaptation has been taken place bring it and again share across those experiences to across the world or across the communities to learn more that's much right so we will be revisiting the tools to modify in the context of covid uh, the last two questions from aftab again and these will be the last questions in this session post this we will close uh because the time is also uh, we are getting late uh so the last two questions are more about linkages with the existing social protection schemes i'll just read the questions one what are the key questions you would consider on connecting humanitarian or early recovery assistance with existing social protection mechanisms and the other is what are the key considerations to link humanitarian early recovery response to nexus in line with social protection schemes so the key questions and considerations for such linkages uh, any of the speakers if you would like to uh, take this question and with this we'll be closing after that can i come in yeah please go ahead uh, okay just to add and thanks after for putting up this uh, question this is one of the important um, deliberations we uh, really were having for longer time and uh, so we are not able to close it because of uh, as i was saying the one of the problem of her assessment is still we look at the needs not at the rights uh, i know mean, the our indian context or the there's a lot of social protection schemes are available which sometimes community access sometimes some of the community access some of the none of the community members uh, uh, do access to schemes probably uh, in um, there has been a efforts in some of the cases is that try to uh, enter the detail um, uh, needs assessment have got a few questions where you try to talk about what are the available schemes in that particular area probably those uh, needs to be elaborated more to understand uh, uh, the specific community related schemes and how those can be helpful in recovery processes uh, because most of the schemes we talk it about uh, are the general uh, rights uh, rights related or um, the welfare schemes so welfare schemes sometimes do not really Uh, give uh, ample opportunities for community for the recovery probably we need to have a bit analysis on that how welfare schemes uh, help in the recovery processes of the community and 
try to look at it in our assessment report. Secondly, uh, the, the, these two nexus, yes, uh, if we really look it into um, the questionnaires on the right uh, best angle or the right perspective angle, we'd be able to get a few answers and that would help us uh, in our recommendations. And then those recommendations need to be really uh, implemented looking at the right best angle because most of the time what we do is that our recommendation talks about the sectoral, uh, center, library and all, but not much on the production issues or the um, advocacy. Uh, there are some advocacy issues comes in, but those has to come as a front line, uh, uh, front line response, I do believe. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to take opportunity this time to thank once again all the panelists uh, for your time and uh, really valuable inputs. We will be able to use this and revisit our tools and processes to make them more effective. Uh, so big thank you to Prestigi, Anjan, Shela, Puna, Mandar. Uh, and also I would like to the, uh, thank the team who's been coordinating this session. So thank you, Praveen and Anil, and to Michelle for the backing support. Uh, with this, I'll hand over back to Anil. Um, and also thanks to all the participants for making this so lively. Thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Anil. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ahilia, for the effective um, uh, moderation of the session. Uh, I also thank uh, each uh, panelist uh, for, uh, for their valuable uh, inputs uh, in this uh, discussion. And I also thank all the participants. Uh, before we end the session, uh, uh, I'll, uh, I'll give you some admin uh, direction. Your certificates will be ready in 24 hours. Please visit our website, www.spareindiacovid19academy.org, and you can download your certificate by scrolling down and finding the name for today's session. It will be ready to download in 24 hours. And uh, in case you are unable to do that uh, uh, or face some uh, technical diff difficulty, you can uh, reach out to our, to our uh, on our email ID, uh, COVID-19 Academy at the rate India.org.in. So we thank you again. Uh, have a great evening and see you all again on next session. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Take care.